Hey everyone, in this video I will be breaking down the second volume of Grant Morrison's Animal Man, which covers issues 10 through 17. Now, the first volume of Animal Man I think was pretty fun, and, you know, pretty friendly to newish kind of comic book readers. This volume, though, <laughs> goes a little bit off the deep end here, with some of the convolutedness of comic book stuff. Especially the first three issue arc in this volume, where we will be exploring Animal Man's origins, but we will be exploring the pre crisis version of Animal Man and how that sort of works with the new version of Animal Man. And also, there's these yellow aliens, which are the creatures that gave Animal Man his powers, and they're going to be in the storyline, sort of making it all the more messy. And uh, it's pretty convoluted, I must say. <laughs> I think I did a good job breaking it down and explaining it to you all, but it can be a little bit of a rough read, and uh, some of you who maybe are not into Grant Morrison's craziness might not dig it. Once we get past that three-issue arc, though, we have Boana Beast back in the story. We have another issue here that sort of deals with setting some stuff up for the future. We have this other issue that has to do with these dolphins and sort of seeing Animal Man's activism and how he is trying to stop animal cruelty around the world. Then we have this villain called the Time Commander that deals with time and see him messing up with time and some time shenanigans. And honestly, pretty fun issue, I thought. And then we have some more setup for the final volume. And the final volume is definitely worth going through. That's where Grant Morrison really does some crazy stuff and it is really interesting. But this middle volume has some highs and lows. All right, though, let's dive into it now. Animal Man Volume 2. Animal Man Volume 2, Origin of the Species, written by Grant Morrison, art by Chaz Truog, Tom Grummet, Doug Hazelwood, Steve Montano, and Mark McKenna. This volume begins with Secret Origins number 39, which covers Animal Man's origins. This was collected in the trade paperback and leads into Animal Man issue 10. Animal Man is with his family, and he is testing out his powers. Ever since the gene bomb, his powers are still wonky. He tries breathing underwater by absorbing a fish's powers, but instead, he absorbs a woodchuck's powers. He tries to absorb powers from a nearby dog, and he accidentally absorbs powers from a flea that was on that dog. And then he jumps really high like a flea could. Buddy expresses how frustrated he is by this. Unbeknown to Animal Man, some yellow aliens are watching him from their ship, which they call the Traveler. Their alien ship is actually buried within the Earth. These yellow aliens were in a deep sleep, but their ship woke them up recently after some alarming events. These yellow aliens are apparently the ones responsible for giving Animal Man his powers all those many years ago. The yellow aliens are concerned, though. This animal man that they are observing, this buddy beggar, seems different than the one that they remembered from all those years ago, the one that they gave powers to. This is where Grant Morrison is going to start referencing or alluding to the Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline and the previous version of Animal Man from in the past. The Animal Man that was originally published in Strange Adventures number 180 way back in 1965. Crisis on Infinite Earths, though, kind of retconned a lot of DC Universe's continuity. Some characters were erased, some were changed, which is what happened with Animal Man. As the Yellow Aliens are observing this new Animal Man, though, they are confused. They comment that the Animal Man they know was a lot older. This one is younger. The yellow aliens also notice other discrepancies within the universe. They speak to each other and say, Hmm, while we slept, there seems to have been a catastrophic and unseen assault on the continuum. You'll also notice that Animal Man has been rendered all but inoperative. Some recent event has undone our morphogenetic graphs and cut him loose from the Avatar bestiary. The graphs can be repaired. But I'm concerned about what has happened to the Continuum while we were asleep. I think we should review the creation of Animal Man as we remember it. 
So the yellow aliens then watch back, within their ship, the origin of the original pre-crisis Animal Man. So the aliens watching back this footage see a young Buddy Baker and Ellen. They were just dating at the time. Buddy and Roger Denning went hunting, and they came across a crashed spaceship. And when it crashed, it gave off some radiation, which knocked Buddy out for a minute. But when Buddy woke up, he had animal powers for some reason. He came across some escaped circus animals that just so happened to escape at that exact moment. And there was a tiger and a gorilla there, and they were facing him, and Buddy managed to absorb the strength of a gorilla and toss this tiger away that attacked him. And he survived the encounter. And then him and Roger looked at that spaceship from afar. And Buddy realized he had these animal powers. Afterwards, he returned to his girlfriend at the time, Ellen, and he proposed to her, something he was struggling to work up the courage to do before. And Ellen said yes. And after that, he vowed to use his great powers in the service of mankind, and dressed himself up in a bright costume and called himself Animal Man. Just as the Yellow Aliens intended. The Yellow Aliens in the current day stop their watchback of the original Animal Man's origin. They comment, yes, something is seriously wrong here. The Buddy Baker that we've just observed is surely an older man, living in a barely defined world. Additionally, his attitudes and motivations seem much less sophisticated than those of the current Buddy Baker. What exactly has happened on this stratum to change everyone quite so radically? We must take rapid action, activate all our agents, major surgery is called for. I wonder if... Buddy Baker will remember us. So, Yellow Aliens are concerned with how the world is now, how the Continuum has been affected, and they are also concerned about Buddy Baker's powers malfunctioning. So, they are going to set out to fix both of these things. Animal Man, Issue 10, Fox on the Run In this issue, we will meet the hero known as Vixen, Vixen first appeared in DC Comics in 1981. She is an African female superhero slash model. She wears something called a Tantu Totem, which has been passed down through her family for generations. The Tantu Totem is a fox-shaped talisman that allows Vixen to harness the spirit of any animal through something called a morphogenetic field, sometimes also known as the Rad. And through this field, it allows her to mimic the abilities of any animal she can think of by simply focusing on a specific animal's abilities and drawing it directly from the field. Her powers are in many ways very similar to Animal Man's. So when the issue begins, Vixen is being chased by some invisible creatures. She is running through the rain. She's trying to get to this plane so that she can get out of here. And as she is running, some random man stops her. He recognizes her as being in the Justice League. He talks to her for a moment. She tries to warn the man of the oncoming danger. All of a sudden, the invisible assailant that was chasing Vixen grabs the man and rips out his spine in front of Vixen. Vixen continues running. She manages to run and grab the leg of a plane that is taking off. And she manages to escape on that plane. Elsewhere, in England, Animal Man saves a fox from some hunters in the name of an activist group. Animal Man, once he securely has the fox, he safely returns it to some activists. And then, he talks with them for a moment and poses in a picture with them. Back in San Diego, in the Baker home, Ellen Baker is talking with her neighbor and friend, Trisha Denning. They are discussing the effects of that gene bomb that went off and how it has messed with her husband, Animal Man's, powers. All of a sudden, while they are conversing, Vixen arrives at the front door and knocks and rings the doorbell, and eventually Ellen goes and lets her inside her home. At Arkham Asylum, Dr. James Highwater, the amnesiac that had a message in a book in his apartment last volume that told him to ask the psycho pirate, has come to Arkham Asylum to do just that. A doctor is showing James around, and as they are headed to the Psycho Pirate's cell, 
James Highwater gets startled by the ramblings of the Batman villain known as the Mad Hatter. The Mad Hatter says, We're all just words on a page. I just thought you ought to know. We're all just a script, rushed out to meet a deadline. We could never aspire to be more than penny dreadful melodrama. Just words on a page. Some cheap hack is writing our lives. This is where Grant Morrison starts really getting more meta. It almost seems as if the Mad Hatter is referencing Grant Morrison, the writer of the book itself here. But we can't tell for sure. Perhaps the Mad Hatter is just insane. The doctor showing James Highwater around tells James, Oh, just ignore him, he's mad as a hatter. Anyway, this is the fellow that you came here to see. He was out for a short while, he seemed completely cured, but now, well, see for yourself. James Highwater is then introduced to Roger Hayden, aka the Psycho Pirate. As I mentioned last volume, Psycho Pirate is one of the only DC characters that remembers how the world used to be before the Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline which completely reshaped the DC Universe. Psycho Pirate asks the Doctor, What do you want? Did Wolfman give you my name? Wolfman is a subtle reference to Marv Wolfman who wrote Crisis on Infinite Earths. So Psycho Pirate is really kind of breaking the fourth wall here unintentionally. The Doctor tells Psycho Pirate that he should stop avoiding sleep. Psycho Pirate replies, How can I sleep? If I go to sleep, they might decide to remove me from the continuity, and then I'll never wake up! Psycho Pirate then tells James Highwater that he has a message for him crumpled up on the floor. James uncrumples the paper, and he reads it. The paper seems to be a page from an Animal Man comic book. Psycho Pirate then says to James, You see now? You see? Well, the mystery of this will be revealed more in time. We jump back over to Animal Man, who has returned home, and he finds it in his home Vixen and him and Vixen talk about how they both have similar powers. Vixen says she is here because she heard Animal Man's name mentioned and she figured they should talk. She tells Animal Man about a bad man in her home country named Hamid Ali, who is referred to as He Who Never Dies. We met the character Bawana Beast last volume. Well, Hamid Ali is Bawana Beast's main villain, way back when they originally appeared in 1967 in Showcase Issue 66 and 67. Hamed Ali has apparently been alive for thousands of years. That is why he is known as He Who Never Dies. Vixen explains that this Hamed Ali is causing all sorts of troubles back in her home country in Africa. He has started excavating some old sacred site, and all the locals are up in arms about it. There has apparently been talks about evil spirits getting loose. Vixen, she also mentions how she was attacked by some invisible creatures. All of a sudden, Animal Man's cat, TC, starts getting scared, sensing something else in the room. Vixen, she comments, they're here. Whatever invisible thing attacked her earlier and ripped out that guy's spine is here in the room with them. All of a sudden, the glass in the window breaks and the invisible assailants burst in. Vixen, she uses a smoke bomb she carries to reveal their assailants, which appear to be odd-looking animal shapes. Buddy looks into the assailant's eyes, and then, as he is gazing in the eyes of the assailant, his body starts unraveling and turns inside out, and he turns into a skeleton, and then he crumbles into dust. As the smoke clears, the yellow aliens that gave Animal Man his powers all those years ago, they appear in the room. They were apparently the invisible attackers who took odd animal shapes moments ago, and they explain to everyone there, we take charge now. Animal Man Issue 11, Out of Africa The Yellow Aliens are attempting to reconstruct Animal Man's body after they unraveled it, and they are doing crazy weird sci-fi surgery to rebuild him. 
They comment that the fate of the universe appears to depend on their success. The one yellow alien says to the other, any mistake, any intrusion that pushes the logic of the continuum too far, and we could unbind this entire stratum. Next, there is a bright light. An animal man, he wakes up and pops out of that light and screams, ah! And then, once he finally calms down, he realizes that he is in Africa, and he doesn't remember how he and Vixen got here. He does notice, though, that his powers have returned to him, and he feels great. Elsewhere, a shaman, the same one we saw in the final pages of last volume, warns of death and destruction at the site of an excavation being run there by the villain Hamad Ali, whom Vixen mentioned last issue. Hamad Ali and his allies are using a giant laser to dig into the Earth. They are unknowingly digging towards the yellow alien spaceship, which is buried here. Animal Man and Vixen talk about what happened in San Diego and how they got here. Vixen explains, So, these two aliens, they appeared in your kitchen and they disintegrated you and they touched me and everything kind of went white and then I was here, in Africa. Just a normal kind of day. So, they are not sure what to make of all this. They then share a meal by a fire that night. Animal Man notices that he seems to have absorbed some powers from some apes that he saw recently. He didn't mean to absorb their powers. The ape's powers seem to make him sexually aroused by every move Vixen is making around the fire as she eats meat and the meat juices are dripping on her body. Before Animal Man is overcome by these sexual feelings, the two of them get attacked by Hamad Ali's minions. They drive some sort of alligator tank towards them, and a henchwoman of Hamad Ali's named Taboo attacks them. They try to fight them all off the best they can, but eventually Taboo overpowers Vixen, and Animal Man gets shot with a drugged dart and passes out. Back in San Diego in the Baker's home, Trisha and Ellen have no recollection of the weird events that just took place. In fact, Everything seems normal to them. Trisha asks Ellen, Where's Buddy? The kids will be home from school any minute, and... Ellen, she seems to have no knowledge of her children, Cliff and Maxine. And suddenly, she begins to disappear from reality. So these are byproducts of some of the weird effects and shenanigans the Yellow Aliens have been doing to try and fix the continuum. In Africa, Hamed Ali has brought Animal Man and Vixen to a secret base of his. He traps them in a room together, and he has separated Vixen from her Tantu Totem, and thus she is powerless. Animal Man is also powerless because they are in a fallout shelter, and the walls are made of concrete and steel, 30 feet thick, and the air is filtered, and the chamber is sealed and sterilized. There are absolutely no animals for Animal Man to draw his powers from. Hamid Ali tells both of them he doesn't know why they are here. Perhaps they are here because of what he is excavating in the earth with his laser? Or maybe they are not. He doesn't really care. He gloats, I was born before Christ. I watched the fall of the Roman Empire and slept through the Renaissance. I have no interest in the motivations of mayflies. Hamid Ali tells them that they will be killed at dawn. He also explains that his associate, Taboo, also has animal powers they may be interested to know. She will use her powers to tear them both to pieces. For now, though, he wants them to reflect on all the dreadful mistakes they have made in their lives. While this is going on, the yellow aliens seem to be negatively affected by the laser that Hamad Ali's people are using to excavate the Earth. It is because the excavation is digging closer and closer to their ship, which is buried in the Earth. The yellow aliens believe that if they cannot fix everything, the universe will be doomed. Buddy and Vixen, trapped in their cell, are trying to think of a plan that they can do to get out of this situation. But before they can come up with anything, Hamad Ali and Taboo return. Animal Man Issue 12, Secret Origins 
Hamad Ali and Taboo have returned to kill Animal Man and Vixen. Animal Man and Vixen are unsure how they're going to get out of this jam, but then Animal Man comes up with an idea. There are no nearby animals around for him to absorb the powers of, so instead he absorbs the powers of bacteria and uses those powers to duplicate himself several times and overwhelm Hamad Ali and Taboo. So all of a sudden, there are hundreds of Animal Mans in the room. In all of the confusion, Animal Man and Vixen slip by and start making their escape. On their way out, Vixen stops to collect her Tantu totem from Taboo's room. In that room, they find a wall of masks. Animal Man comments, It's like the animal's souls are trapped in these masks. This must be how Taboo gets her animal powers. So Vixen decides to plant a bomb in the room. The two of them leave the building. The bomb explodes, destroying the masks. Once outside, Animal Man, who now has full control of his powers again, easily overpowers some of Hamad Ali's soldiers. And then he flies him and Vixen away. As they are flying away, they come across a strange light in the sky that is emanating from Hamad Ali's excavation site. They approach a pit in the excavation site, and that is the source of the weird light. Animal Man, he wants to go down into the pit to investigate. The light is causing strange effects on those in the area. Some of the men in the area start having their faces disappear. Vixen reluctantly decides to accompany Animal Man, and they both drop down into the mysterious pit. Inside the pit, it is trippy and really weird. Animal Man then comes across one of those yellow aliens. The yellow alien sees Animal Man and says, You came. Outside of the pit, Hamad Ali and Taboo arrive, and Hamad Ali says they will follow them down into the pit. In the pit, Animal Man and Vixen are talking to the yellow alien. Vixen says that she doesn't trust these yellow aliens. These aliens were the invisible attackers. They killed a man at the airport. They had different shapes then. The yellow alien explains, those were memory forms plucked from the template. It's true that some of the more bestial forms are difficult to control, but the man that died was of no consequence. He had no background, no name. He was an incidental character. So the yellow alien is kind of breaking the fourth wall once again. He's saying the man they killed at the airport, you know, the one they ripped the spine out of, he doesn't matter anyway because, quote, he was a man of no consequence. He had no background, no name. He was an incidental character. As the yellow alien is continuing to talk, they get interrupted by Hamad Ali and Taboo. A fight ensues. Taboo is fighting Vixen, and she manages to stab Vixen multiple times. But oddly, this seems to have no effect on Vixen. She gets cut and bleeds, but then her wounds disappear like nothing happened. And as Vixen is fighting Taboo, the Yellow Alien and Animal Man continue on and talk some more. Animal Man asks, We've met before, haven't we? When I just started out as Animal Man? Weren't you trying to invade Earth or something? The Yellow Alien explains, That was just deception. Our ship, the Traveler, has been buried here in the Earth for 10,000 years. Periodically, we assume memory forms and travel to the surface. We have brought animal powers to various humans over the years. The Tantu Totem that Vixen uses, that was the Yellow Aliens. The Helmet and Elixir that Bawana Beast uses for his powers, that too was them. The Spirit Masks that Taboo was using, that was them as well. And finally, Animal Man is also their creation. The aliens further reveal that Buddy Baker did not survive the initial explosion that gave him his animal powers, but instead, the yellow aliens had rebuilt his body cell by cell. And his animal powers derive from something called morphogenetic grafts. The grafts were damaged by recent events, and the yellow aliens have been forced to destroy his body and rebuild him once again. The alien also says that the elements of the continuum have been put out of place by the recent crisis that took place on this stratum. 
The crisis we discovered has resulted in the current threat to your reality. The continuum was radically altered at the time, but some holes remained unseen pockets of contradiction. Your life was one such contradiction. The animal man that we created was an older man in a simpler world. He should not have existed in the post-crisis continuum, and yet, somehow your history remained unaltered. You were living in a paradox now that paradox threatens to destroy the structure of your reality. The alien says that he wants to use Animal Man's memories now to fix this paradox and save the universe. Well, Animal Man's gonna go along with this. The yellow alien directs him to direct his thoughts into the breach. The forces that are being released now will be felt across the entire stratum, but it's still not too late to prevent the final catastrophic unbinding. As Animal Man remembers his origin of how he got his powers, the yellow alien gets to work manipulating things, and somehow he's able to fix this continuum. Hamid Ali then interrupts them and threatens the yellow aliens and Animal Man with a gun, and Hamid Ali shoots the yellow alien in his head. The yellow alien is fine though, he's able to ignore this. The yellow alien then tells Hamid Ali, We are agents of the power that brings your world into being. How can you hope to have power over us? Ahmed Ali yells back, I have seen centuries pass like years. I will not be stopped by you. You hear me? I am Hamad Ali. I am he who never dies. Do you hear me? The yellow alien replies, You are nothing. A minor character. Old-fashioned and melodramatic. Best forgotten. Your story ends here. Hamad Ali then gets erased from the comic book page. His drawings become cruder and cruder, until he's eventually just a stick figure, and then he fully disappears. The yellow aliens have erased Hamad Ali from comic book continuity. Sure, Hamad Ali is he who never dies, but that doesn't mean he can't be just erased from continuity. With the yellow aliens now having put everything back together, right. They then disappear and leave. And all of a sudden, the pit in the earth is sealed like it was never there. Animal Man and Vixen are outside of the pit on the earth's surface and are confused. All of the soldiers around them are dead. Vixen asks, what happened? Animal Man answers, I think the good guys won. Animal Man, issue 13, Hour of the Beast. A news report speaks of apartheid tensions in South Africa between white police forces cruelly treating black citizen activists. There are outbreaks of violence and bloodshed. Black protest leader Archbishop Mogotusi said, The situation in this country is rapidly deteriorating. Anyone can see that. If things are allowed to continue unchanged, I foresee serious, very serious eruptions. Elsewhere in Africa, at an airport, Animal Man and Bawana Beast meet for coffee. Bawana Beast was seeing Vixen off on her plane and just so happened to run into Animal Man, so they decided to talk a bit. They discussed their fight in San Diego from almost a year ago. Animal Man said that that fight had a big impact on his life. He realized all the terrible stuff being done to animals and he started trying to do things about it. Bawana Beast explains that he has decided to give up the mantle of Boana Beast. It has become too emotionally draining for him, and he wants to find a new successor to carry on the mantle. Boana Beast asks Animal Man if he wants to help him with that, and Animal Man decides to tag along. They head south into Tanzania to Kilimanjaro, the home of Boana Beast. They go to Boana Beast's cave, where he performs a ritual that will help him pinpoint his successor. Bawana Beast drinks an elixir, and he gets a vision from it on where the next beast's location will be, and that location is in South Africa. So they begin heading there to find this person. In South Africa, a young South African photographer and activist named Dominic Minda has taken photos showing the white cruelty to blacks in their country. He wants these photos shown to the world, but in order to get them seen by the world, 
he needs to get the photo smuggled out of the country. Dominic asks a journalist friend of his named David Quinn to smuggle the undeveloped film out of the country and to the United States. Reluctantly, the journalist David Quinn agrees. After the meeting, Dominic, as he is walking along, gets attacked, beaten, and imprisoned by the police. When he is in a prison cell, he is visited by a man named Mr. Vandevort. Mr. Vandevort is a police officer, and he starts setting Dominic's cell up in such a way to stage Dominic's suicide. He places a stool and noose in the cell. Vandevort then tells Dominic about their plan to assassinate the Archbishop Mogatusi. They are planning on riling up the populace and drawing him out. He compares his plan to the myth of the beastly deadly unicorn. Hunters would use virgin women to distract the unicorn while hunters would sneak up to kill it. Vandevort also tells Dominic that he knows of the incriminating photographs that Dominic took and slipped to his journalist pal David Quinn, and that David will be detained at the airport before he ever gets out of the country with those photos. Now, before Vandevort can hang Dominic, Bawana Beast and Animal Man arrive and they break into the prison cell. They knock out Vandevort and save Dominic. Dominic is the one that has been chosen in Bawana Beast's vision to become the next beast. Later on, Bawana Beast is explaining to Dominic how he has been chosen and all of the details of Bawana Beast and all the powers he will have. Dominic, he is interested in taking up this mantle. Although he doesn't love the name Bawana Beast, he finds it to be a little imperialist for his tastes. He would prefer to go by another name. He eventually will take up the name Freedom Beast instead. Dominic drinks the elixir and begins the process of becoming the next beast. Later on, at a growing black protest in South Africa there, Mr. Vandervoort begins enacting his plan to rile up the people and draw out this archbishop. Vandevort and the police are riling up the crowd in an effort to cause anarchy. They want this situation to turn bloody. He threatens the crowd on loudspeakers to disperse in three minutes or they will begin firing. Archbishop Mogotusi on a loudspeaker speaks to his people and starts broadcasting a message saying, Brothers and sisters, please return to your homes peacefully. This is not the way. Don't give them any more excuses. You are being led into a trap. Please return to your homes. Violence is not the answer. Brothers and sisters, it is the way of our oppressors. I beg you to return to your homes. Vandevort doesn't want the protesters to disperse as he wants this protest to turn deadly. Buona Beast in his civilian clothes as Mike Maxwell steps out of the crowd. He tells the police, fire on these people and you fire on me. It won't be so easy to explain the death of an American. Vandevort doesn't care and shoots Michael anyway, and he gets hit in the shoulder. Animal Man then causes an earthquake, which does cause the crowd to disperse peacefully. In the confusion, Vandevort locates the Archbishop Mogatusi and threatens him with a gun. The Archbishop is surprised, and Dominic arrives as the new beast, Freedom Beast, and he uses his animal fusing powers to create a zebra unicorn, and the zebra unicorn runs and charges at this Vandervoort and skewers him right through his chest, killing him. Freedom Beast used a unicorn to kill Vandervoort as symbolism for what Vandervoort was talking about earlier when he told his story of unicorns. In the aftermath, the Archbishop and the protesters were safe, and Bawana Beast would stay in Africa to train Dominic the new beast, Freedom Beast. And David Quinn, the journalist that Dominic gave the incriminating photos to earlier, well, the film was switched out for regular vacation photos at the airport, so David Quinn was not detained. Instead, Animal Man got those photos and snuck them out of the country when he flew out. And in the epilogue, Animal Man returns home to America 
and he goes to the Daily Planet offices in Metropolis, and he delivers those photos to Perry White himself. And we assume those photos would have some sort of political impact in the future. Animal Man, issue 14, Spooks. Maxine Baker is playing outside in her backyard when she sees the unidentified figure we saw watching Ellen and Cliff last volume. This mystery man actually looks identical to Maxine's dad, Buddy Baker, although a slightly different version wearing some different clothes. This alternate version of Buddy Baker tries to talk to Maxine, but she can't hear him. She can see him, though. He says, Hello, Maxine. Oh, you can't hear me, can you? I, I can't even warn you. Oh, Maxine, Maxine, I miss you. I miss you all so much. Ellen, she runs outside in the backyard when she sees Maxine talking to this weird-looking man, but the mysterious Buddy Baker disappears. Ellen asks her daughter, Who is that man you are talking to? I told you to never, ever speak to strange men. And Maxine tells her mom, it wasn't a strange man, it was Daddy. Why was he crying, Mommy? When Ellen goes back inside her home, she then gets a phone call. And it is her husband. He is at the airport. He has returned from Africa. So if Buddy Baker was at the airport, then who is this Buddy Baker here? Elsewhere, Dr. James Highwater, the amnesiac, had a dream about the nature of reality. When he wakes from his dream, he has no idea where he is. And when he looks out the window, he realizes that he is now in San Francisco. Elsewhere, a man calling himself Mr. Lennox arrives at the home of a woman named Miss Linfield. Mr. Lennox is supposedly here as a religious emissary spreading the word of God. He is actually, though, an assassin known as the White Owl. He shoots and kills Miss Linfield as well as anyone else inside the home. At the Baker house, Cliff Baker and his friends are playing with a Ouija board. The Ouija board spells out Cliff, and then the number 9 and 27. At the same time, Ellen in her kitchen senses someone standing behind her. She turns around brandishing a knife, but no one is there. The calendar in the kitchen is open to September. If we kind of connect the Ouija board and the calendar... Somebody is trying to warn them about September, the ninth month of the year, and the 27th. The real Buddy Baker then returns home and startles Ellen. Ellen has Buddy search the house for whatever this mysterious figure is in the house. When he searches, he finds nothing. But as the day draws on, this mysterious alternate Buddy Baker appears outside their window in the rain. Buddy, he follows the alternate Buddy outside. Eventually, he is face to face with this other man. Buddy, he comments, I know you. When I was 10 years old, I, I, I saw you. I, I know you. And this other man disappears. When Buddy goes back inside, he tells Ellen that he doesn't know what happened or who that was. This mysterious alternate Buddy Baker wrote 9 and 27 on the door before he disappeared. Animal Man, Issue 15, The Devil and the Deep Blue Sea On the Faroe Islands in a small oceanside bar, two men, Dane Durance and his companion, Johannes, discuss their plans. They are waiting to be joined by Animal Man and a superhero woman named Dolphin. Dolphin is not literally a dolphin, her name just happens to be Dolphin. She's a character connected to Aquaman's stable of characters. She's actually married to a man named Garth, aka Aqualad, who is kind of like Aquaman's Robin. Dolphin can breathe underwater like many Atlanteans. As these two men are waiting, a whaler named Onger Nielsen talks with them. Onger is a mad murdering son of a bitch, according to Dane. Onger, he starts a fight with Dane and Johannes. He breaks a bottle, and he threatens to stab them with it. Just as the fight is starting to get heated, Animal Man arrives in the bar, and he stuns everyone inside with a sonic blast ability. 
that he picked up from a pistol shrimp. A pistol shrimp has the ability to snap their claws together and produce sonic blasts, stunning their prey. So this is the ability Animal Man used. With Animal Man successfully stopping this bar fight, he then leaves with Dane and Johannes. They all get on a boat together and sail out into the ocean. And on that boat, they begin talking about the situation here in the Faroe Islands. Dane explains there is an annual tradition here on the Faroe Islands where the Ferozi people slaughter schools of dolphins for fun rather than for food. It is a particularly barbaric practice. People come from miles around with their kids to do this. What they do is they have some people go out on boats into the ocean and they herd the dolphins to shore with loud ultrasonic noises confusing them. And then the spectators waiting on shore all start stabbing the dolphins with various weapons once they come in. And they do stuff like the man will cut the fetuses from the bodies of the pregnant dolphins and give them to their children to play with. Animal Man is definitely going to help them stop this practice. They all go into the ocean, Dane and Johannes in scuba gear, and they're swimming around and they greet the hero, Dolphin. Once again, her name is Dolphin, she's not a dolphin, but they're going to save the dolphins. <laughs> they all prepare for their plans to disrupt this dolphin slaughtering happening soon. The next morning, the whaler, Anger Nielsen, and the Ferozi people gather at the beach to begin the slaughter. Anger Nielsen is in a boat, using ultrasound, trying to herd the dolphins to shore to be slaughtered. Animal Man and the hero Dolphin swim under the water and try to guide the dolphins away from Anger and his men. Anger, he realizes what they are trying to do. He grows furious. He will not allow this. He says that he knows a way to keep the dolphins where they want them. No dolphin will leave an injured comrade behind. So Anger harpoons one of the female dolphins in the water. So the other dolphins will no longer stray off and they will instead stay and continue to swim to shore and their slaughter. Animal Man is so enraged when he sees this. He swims up and slams Anger's boat, causing it to capsize. The dolphins, they continue their approach to shore for their slaughter. The gathered Ferozi people advance, readying for their attacking. Dane Durance, with the machine gun, fires it in the water, establishing a perimeter between the attackers on land and the dolphins. Anger Nielsen, who has now swam to shore since his boat sank, rises from the water. He tells Dane Durance, You think you're so clever, you and your American money and your superheroes? You think you own us and you can tell us how to live, eh? You look, you see this. This is what I think of your environmentalism. Anger then grabs a young dolphin by the tail and stabs it several times, killing it. Dane is furious. Animal Man is furious as well. He flies over and grabs Anger out of the water and flies him high into the air, over the ocean, way out. Animal Man asks him, Now give me one reason, give me one good reason not to drop you, you bastard. Anger says, Heights, please, I'm afraid of heights. Animal Man says, I said a good reason. And he drops Anger into the ocean in anger. In the aftermath, the dolphin slaughter is prevented this year. The hero dolphin swims away and guides the dolphins to safety back into the deeper ocean. Dane Durance asks Animal Man, what ended up happening to Anger? Animal Man says, I lost my temper. I gave him to the fishes. So Animal Man essentially left Anger to die way in the deep ocean. Later on, we see Anger is struggling to still swim back to land. He starts drowning. But a dolphin, while resentful of Anger and the other humans, saves Anger's life because killing is not the dolphin way. And the dolphin swims Anger back to land. Animal Man Issue 16, The Clockwork Crimes of the Time Commander At the Baker home, Ellen gets a letter saying that a company wants to publish her children's book that she is working on. Ellen's aspirations to write a children's book was mentioned way back in Issue 1. 
Bonty is so proud of his wife. He insists that they go to Paris to celebrate. They get dressed, and then Buddy and Ellen teleport over to the Justice League Europe in Paris. This is where Buddy works as Animal Man, and I guess he often teleports over to Europe in order to get to work. When they arrive at the Justice League Europe headquarters, we see various colleagues of Animal Man's in the JLE. There is Metamorpho, the Elongated Man, Ralph Dinby, his wife, Sue Dinby, and Dimitri Pushkin, a.k.a. the android known as Rocket Rad. Animal Man and Ellen say hello to them all. Elsewhere, a strange man named John Starr slowly begins remembering his identity. He finds his old costume, he tries it on, and it fits. John Starr is the villain known as the Time Commander. Buddy and Ellen, they walk through Paris. Buddy asks, Did anything strange happen to you while I was in Africa? Remember, Ellen disappeared from reality in issue 11 when Buddy was in Africa, a byproduct of those yellow aliens' shenanigans. Ellen, though, now has no memory of this. She says, Hmm, I did have a kind of blackout for a couple of minutes. I remember because I spilled the coffee. Ellen does think it was a little weird, but she doesn't really remember, and she's used to weird being Buddy's wife. She says, look, if I wanted a ordinary life, I'd have married a dentist, but I didn't, okay? As they're walking the Paris streets, all of a sudden, they come across a rampaging dinosaur. The dinosaur is here due to the Time Commander's meddling and shenanigans. Buddy is surprised. He uses his Animal Man powers and punches the dinosaur out cold. Moments later, Justice League Europe members Metamorpho, the Elongated Man, and Rocket Red arrive. Elongated Man explains that time is going crazy. They just saw some German tanks and a caveman, and the French Revolution is happening around the corner. Animal Man asks if they know what's causing it. Elongated Man explains, well, the only lead we've got is that the time when all the clocks stopped was 11.55. That's the trademark of a guy called John Starr, the Time Commander. He had a run-in with Green Lantern a few years ago. He's pretty obscure, but this could be him. Time then seems to rewind backwards, and all the various destruction on the street gets fixed. At a cemetery elsewhere, the Time Commander wrecks more havoc with time. He brings dead people back to life. He then sees himself ten minutes in the future with a broken nose. The Justice League Europe then arrive, and they fight the Time Commander. The Time Commander manages to take most of them out, and then he turns his attention to Animal Man. Time Commander asks Animal Man, So, you want to fight me too, huh? Do you want to try to hit me? Animal Man, rather than fight the Time Commander, attempts to reason with him. He says, No, not really. Just because I wear a costume doesn't mean I enjoy fighting. I'm just a little concerned about what you're doing here. I mean, you should really think about it. As Animal Man thinks he is maybe getting through, Metamorpho punches Time Commander in the face, breaking his nose and knocking him out. Animal Man is disappointed that things ended violently. Later that night, Buddy and Ellen are having dinner together at a restaurant. They discuss how everything in their life seems to be going great. Ellen's book is going to be a big seller, Buddy's in the Justice League, and their kids are doing fine. They feel blessed. Outside, though, the assassin, known as Mr. Lennox, drives by. A hint at ominous tidings to come. Animal Man, Issue 17, Consequences in Glasgow, in Scotland, at the famous necropolis at the center of the city, the assassin, Mr. Lennox, meets with Mirror Master. Mr. Lennox wants to learn from Mirror Master the layout of Animal Man's home, as he has been hired to kill Buddy Baker and his family. Mr. Lennox has no scruples about killing Buddy's wife and children. Mirror Master, however, does have a problem with that and he refuses to give Lennox the information he needs. Lennox pulls a gun on Mirror Master and tries to shoot at him, 
but Lennox ends up getting trapped in the Mirror Dimension instead. At night in one of the University of California's laboratories, Animal Man and a group of activists have broken in and find cages full of monkeys with their eyes sewn shut. The monkeys are part of some sort of sight deprivation experiments. Animal Man is outraged and helps the activists to free the monkeys who were going to get the monkeys' help. As they are leaving the laboratory, the leader of the activists begins setting fire to the laboratory. Animal Man is concerned and tells the leader, I don't think you should be doing that. But the leader says he knows what he's doing, so Animal Man lets it go and does nothing to stop it. And the laboratory goes up in flames. Elsewhere, Dr. James Highwater is in his car driving. He is on his way to find Animal Man. As he is driving, his hands start phasing out of existence, similar to what we saw happen to that Hamid Ali a few issues ago. Highwater starts losing control of his vehicle. Later on, as Buddy Baker returns home, he finds his son Cliff eating a hamburger with meat. Buddy reprimands his son Cliff for not following their vegetarianism that their family has adopted. Cliff shares that he feels like an outcast because everyone else at school eats meat and they think he's weird. Buddy explains the many environmental concerns revolving around eating meat to Cliff. He says, When you eat a burger, right, you're contributing to the destruction of the rainforests. Massive areas of forests get cleared every day to produce grazing land for that cattle that gets turned into burgers. Those forests are the lungs of the world. When they're gone, the carbon dioxide levels will go way up. That's the greenhouse effect, and it's already happening. Every time you eat a burger, you're helping to kill the world. Everything's connected. That's all I'm trying to say, Cliff. That's why I do what I do. I don't want to see you and Maxine growing up on a dying planet. Ultimately, though, Buddy leaves it up to Cliff to decide for himself. Later on, Buddy is talking with his wife, Ellen. Ellen is disappointed. She tells Buddy that she was watching the news, and she saw that there was a chemical fire at the University of California's Animal Laboratory last night, and three firemen got severely injured trying to put out the flames. Buddy is horrified when he learns this, as he was partly responsible. These were just people doing their job and his involvement with those activists and not stepping up when he could have has now led to these people being injured. Alan says that Roger wants to talk with Buddy too. So Buddy goes to talk with his friend and manager, Roger Denning. Roger says that Buddy has become overly obsessed with animal rights and environmental issues. He no longer converses, he just lectures. Buddy is not sure what to say. He's so frustrated with how the world is and he's trying to do his part. Roger ends up telling Buddy that he will still be his friend, but he no longer wants to be his manager. Buddy accepts this and he starts thinking that he doesn't even know if he wants to be Animal Man anymore either. The next day, Animal Man makes an appearance in a televised debate, which does not go well. The debate starts out on the topic of animal testing, which Animal Man is against. His opponent, a man named Dr. Whitmore, is on the side of the medical community and is making some counterpoints to Animal Man. Eventually, Whitmore steers the debate towards Animal Man himself, and he says what gives Animal Man here the authority to interfere with other human beings' freedom of choice if what they're doing is legal? Why can Animal Man stop animal testing in a facility that is legal or stop fox hunting in England or the other things he has done? Animal Man argues, look, all I'm saying is that moral laws are more important than the law of the land. Whitmore asks Animal Man, yeah, well, would you break the law? Animal Man answers, if I thought the law was morally wrong, then I guess I would. Whitmore then responds, and you sit there wearing that costume knowing full well that you are a role model to countless American children. Let me put this to you. Have you broken the law? Animal Man pauses and thinks about it, then he kind of outbursts and says, I don't see how that has anything at all to do with what we're discussing here. You're avoiding the real issues. I mean, what I do 
as an individual has absolutely nothing to do with what we're really supposed to be discussing here. I refuse to be set up as a role model for children or anyone else. I do what I think is right, and it has nothing to do with you. I'm not Superman, I'm just a man, and I make mistakes like anyone else. And just because I wear a costume doesn't mean I always have to be right. Whitmore has sort of won this debate by manipulating Animal Man into this outburst and getting him off topic. Before Animal Man returns home that day, he breaks things off with the activist group he was working with before. He also tells the man, the leader of the activists there, that he is, in addition, going to retire as Animal Man and is leaving the Justice League. When Buddy returns home, his wife Alan is frantic. She ushers him inside their home, and inside their home, James Highwater is there. He is lying on the floor. His legs are now disappearing, and James begs for Animal Man's help. And with this, we end Animal Man Volume 2. Alright, so that was Volume 2 of Grant Morrison's Animal Man, and I really loved parts of this volume and was mixed on other parts. The three-issue Yellow Alien Vixen Hamad Ali story arc, there were things in there I really liked, like I thought it was cool how the Yellow Aliens erased Hamad Ali from continuity because he's a bad character, he doesn't deserve to still be in comic books. And there was some fun exploring the previous version of Animal Man and the current version of Animal Man and Grant Morrison playing with comic book continuity and making it part of the storyline. So aspects of that were cool, although I think Grant Morrison went a little bit too crazy for me and weird in this story arc. So there are parts of it that I didn't think were very friendly to read. But still, he's exploring some interesting ideas in there, and you gotta give him credit for that. We then had the Bawana Beast in South Africa storyline, finding this new Freedom Beast character. That was an okay one. We had the Spooks storyline, where we were sort of teasing some stuff that's gonna pay off next volume, so I won't say much more than that. We had the dolphin activism storyline, which I think it was interesting seeing some of Animal Man's animal activism around the world and how he is doing his part. Then we had the Time Commander Justice League Europe storyline, which I thought was really fun. Time Commander just messing with time and seeing some of Animal Man's colleagues was a good time. Uh, and then the last issue in this volume, we kind of had Animal Man having some crisis. He's doing all this animal activism, but it is having some negative consequences. Some firemen got seriously injured, and Animal Man is thinking of giving up the mantle. And then, the big tease at the end of this issue was this James Highwater showing up at Animal Man's house, and his legs are missing. He's sort of being erased from continuity, and he needs Animal Man's help. And we are going to be following up on that next volume, where we are going to really go to some crazy places. Overall, I would give this volume a 7.5 out of 10. I thought aspects of it were really fun, but there are parts I am mixed on. Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and next week I will be back with the conclusion, which really does some interesting stuff. So I will see you all then there for that.